Christ. And today, we're going to talk about good works. Good works are a response to our salvation. We don't do good works for salvation. We do good works because God has given us his grace. Now, for me specifically, I am more of a sweets guy. Are you anybody more of a sweets than a salty person? Yeah. I can literally sit down and eat a half a dozen donuts, no problem. Although I do get sick. Ah, man, I love me some sweets, man. I'm telling you right now, I have a sweet tooth and I battle against it every day. Pretty sure I've got a sugar addiction. You know they say sugar is just as addicting as cocaine? Isn't that crazy? I mean, I I know it's weird. I mean, I'm not a drug addict, but if sugar was a drug, I guess I would be a drug addict. So I fight all the time to try to not eat sugar, and I just, I love sweets. But there, every once in a while, I do like to have some nice, savory, salty food. You know, a nice good steak, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese. All of you are like, Rick, just get done preaching because we're ready for lunch. But uh, man, have you ever had chocolate-covered bacon? It sounds awful, but it's actually kind of good. Although, my favorite donut, just to let you know, is a maple cream filled, okay? That's my favorite. If you ever decide to get me a donut, that's, that's what I'll take every single time. But there are actually donuts where they sprinkle bacon on top. I mean, it's this wonderful combination. It's like heaven and earth meet together in one, one food serving. But have you ever tasted, have you ever tasted salt just by itself? If you ever had a spoonful of salt, it would, ma- it would be enough to make you, what, go, Pah, this is disgusting. What did I just eat? My, uh, my home preacher back in Ohio, I'm from uh, southeastern Ohio, and uh, his wife Janet, she made some of the best apple pies you would ever eat. They were so good. Well, Janet, you know, God bless her poor little heart, one day she accidentally substituted sugar uh, with salt. And so we went to take a bite of the apple pie, and it was the worst apple pie you could ever imagine because it had all of this nasty, disgusting salt in it rather than sugar. So, but y- you know this, right? If I eat too many donuts, I start to get sick. And there's something about an overload on sweets where you're like, look, I cannot eat another sweet thing. I need something salty. And that's what Jesus is teaching in Matthew chapter 5. We love to preach on grace and forgiveness and mercy and compassion. We love the sweet side of the gospel. But what Jesus has to say here in Matthew chapter 5 is that although salt, when you first taste it, it's a little repulsive, you start to step back and learn, wow, this is actually a good thing. In your wisdom and in your life experience, the things that may be bitter at first actually come to your benefit. I'd like for you to read in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13 with me. This is what Jesus had to say. He talks about two things, the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Now, Matthew chapter 5, a little bit of background, it's the Sermon on the Mount. And here's the main point of Matthew chapter 5. What kind of person does God want me to be? The Sermon on the Mount. What kind of person does God want me to be? And so we're going to get a little bit of a glimpse at this kind of, this person that God wants us to be. Look at verse 13. It says this. Jesus says to his disciples and to the people sitting there listening to his sermon, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You know, salt is something that we all take advantage of today. But back in the ancient times, salt was a luxury that not too many people had. It was actually a commodity that they would use in order to train for goods, gold, silver. Salt was one of the most prized possessions that you could have. They actually, there was this sea called the Dead Sea, very, very salty sea um, in, in, in the Israel uh, land. And so they would take it and they would actually get the salt foam off the top of the water. And that would be one of the ways that they would produce salt. They could also mine salt out of the earth. And so salt Salt became this thing that they would use, not just to make their food taste better, but it was actually a way that they would preserve their meat. For those of you who know anything about meat, they didn't have refrigerators back then. There wasn't an excellent way to keep it cool. And so one of the things that they would do is they would take their meat and they would rub it down with salt. This is how you preserve your meat, to rub it down with salt. We actually still have some of that food today. There's actually meat, the way that you cook it, is by putting salt on it and just letting it hang there for a while. And it's absolutely delicious. If we could only put that on top of a donut, then it would actually be really, really good. I know, I'm sorry. Kyle, our student minister, he always gets on me. He's like, look, Rick, it's, donut jokes are too much, okay? They're too much, and I'm sorry about that. So anyway, so salt, salt it's got a lot of different characteristics. Um, when we look at the context of this passage of Scripture, we know that salt was used to preserve meat. It was used to enhance the flavor of their food. And notice what Jesus says here. He says, if the salt loses its flavor, 
So salt has the ability to give flavor to that which is otherwise bland, and it has a purpose. But if salt loses its purpose, what do you do with the salt? You throw it out. You get rid of it. Job actually, in Job chapter 6, he talked a little bit about salt, and he said, he said basically this, egg whites are disgusting unless you put what on them? Salt. And so salt has the purpose of making things better. One of the first experiences, I've got to tell you this because it's hilarious. One of the first experiences that I've had uh, at this church, worship leader was up here on stage. I think we, it was maybe our second time visiting. And he's standing here and he's getting ready to go into prayer time. And he, and he goes into prayer time. This is like the best thing. I'll never forget it. And, and hopefully you won't after this Sunday. He goes into prayer time and he goes, Lord, let us be like salt because it just makes everything taste better. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, this is my kind of church. You know what I mean? This is me. It was absolutely hilarious. But this idea of salt, Jesus is basically saying this. Life becomes nothing more than a burden when everything has lost its purpose. When you lose the taste, when you lose the flavor. And so Jesus is saying, what kind of person do I want you to be? I want you to be the kind of person that adds value to the place and the people you live with. What kind of person do God, does God want us to be? He wants us to be the kind of person that adds taste to the people and the places and the things around us. That's what it means to be the salt. And so he uses this metaphor of the salt to teach us a very important relationship, that our relationship with God and each other does several things. First of all, it, pre it preserves us from decay. Like I said, you would rub salt on meat if you wanted to preserve your meat. You didn't want it to rot. And so salt preserves the things that it acts upon. And look, the Bible is very clear. We live in a time and in an age and in a culture where things are under decay, it's not only true of science, the world is leading towards chaos and decay, but it's even true of ourselves. Our natural tendencies are to sin, or to break ourselves down. The Bible's very clear, sin, sin brings about death. And so as Christians who are being followers of God, we are called to preserve that which is beautiful and good and wholesome. And one of the ways that we do that is we strive to be the person that Matthew chapter 5 is, is, is talking about. We are called to preserve that which is undergoing decay. We are to fight back against the disease of sin and death. And we do that by being a Jesus follower. Instead of taking salt and putting it on the shelf, we need to get it out of the pantry and we need to use it. And guess what that means? That means you and I got to get out of these pews and we got to bring value and saltiness to the people around us. We've got to get out of this box that we call the building, and we've got to get out there in the world, and we've got to add value to the people and the things around us with the good news of Jesus. And for a lot of us, that's uncomfortable. For a lot of us, we don't think we have the time or the ability, or maybe we just don't even want to. But remember, we're asking what kind of person should we be, not what kind of person we are. And that's why I love the good news of the gospel. Look, are these people Christians that Jesus is speaking to in Matthew chapter 5? No. No. Have they received the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit? No. Has Jesus died for their sins yet? No. Here's what's so powerful. Jesus sees these people as they could be, not necessarily as they are. And when God looks at you and he says, you are the salt of the earth, he looks at you as you could be, as your potential is, not necessarily as you are. That is the power of the gospel. That is the good news that Jesus has to bring. If you're going to be a kingdom citizen, you could be so much more than what you are. You are salt that adds value and flavor and purpose to the people and the things around you if you're willing to be used that way. So salt not only preserves from decay, but salt also produces its effects secretly and surely. I think one of, the, one of the things that we battle against in our social media culture is we want to demonstrate that we are Jesus followers. And if we can't put it on our Facebook and our Instagram and, you know, whatever other social media platform, Twitter that we have, we may not feel like that we're showing people the kind of person that God has created us to be. You see, the Pharisees, they struggled with this thing. They would actually, every time they came into the temple and they would give their tithe, they would make sure everybody knew it. And they would blow their trumpet and they would beat their chest. They would say, look at me and how awesome I am. Look at how much value I add to the kingdom and the people around me. And there certainly is that temptation as a church. We want Severn to know what kind of church we are. 
who we are as a body of believers. We want to have a reputation in the community, and you can't develop that reputation unless you share it with other people. While at the same time, we have to have a balance. We have to make sure that we're not being a Pharisee and a hypocrite and just putting things out there for the sake of our own merit and our own gain. And so here's the point. Is the purpose of salt to focus? Does anybody take a bite of steak and say, man, that salt is delicious? What do they say? The steak is really, really good. So you can see what salt does. It puts the spotlight on that which it touches. And when people look at us and they see us and they interact with us, Jesus is going on to say, they will give glory to God. And so that's the difference. Where is the attitude of our heart? And what is the outcome of our good works and our faith? And so we are to be the kind of person that prevents decay. We are to be the kind of person that produces results secretly but surely. And finally, salt retains its value only if it retains its distinctive character. Here's the thing about salt. If you mistreat it, it will eventually harden and it becomes useless. And what do you do with useless salt? Well, for many of us, we just throw it in the garbage can. But you know what they would do? They would actually take the salt and they would throw it out onto the paths and it would be good for people to walk on. What is God saying here? You have potential. You have ability. But if you don't use it, you've lost your purpose and you're not being useful to God. So when we talk about our good works, this analogy of salt, what God is telling us is this. He sees you as you can be if you're willing to be that. But when you stop using your purpose and your ability, you become purposeless and useless to God. Now, if God's given us his grace, if he's given us salvation through his name, that should be the exact opposite of what we want and we strive for, right? Isn't that what we are fighting against? Our sin, our disease, our self-destructive habits? And so if we have really been penetrated by the grace of God, we will want to please him in every way and shape and form that we can. And it starts with letting God use you for his glory. And so Jesus issues this warning. He doesn't describe the disciples as they are. He sees them as he can be. But he says, if you don't become what you can be, you become useless. And so what's the point? Here's the point. If you are willing to be the salt of the earth, you can transform the world around you. And that's awesome. You start with your kids, you start with your church, you start with your spouse, you start with your coworkers, you go on to your community, and slowly but surely, if you are willing to be the salt of the earth, you are able to transform everything that you touch. That's the power of the gospel. And so first and foremost, he told them, if you are going to be a citizen in the kingdom of God, from God's point of view, you are the salt of the earth. You have a purpose. You have a plan. And that's to change the world around you. And then he shifts to another analogy. Look what he goes on to say in verse 14. He says, you're not only the salt of the earth, but you are the light of the world. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket and put it on a lampstand. It gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so the first thing he says is this, you are the light of the world. And here's the reality. True disciples of Jesus Christ don't just simply reflect the light. Light to them was fire. So what they would do is if I was going to pass my light onto you, um, I would get a stick and I would wrap it with some type of material and some type of ointment that would burn like oil. And I would take your your fire and I would carry it on to my own. And we all know that Bible song, don't we? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Now, I'm not going to torture you by singing the rest of it, okay? But you get the point. This is our light that we have gotten from God and we are called to let it shine. You are not just the light of your home. You are the light of the world. Now, here's something interesting about light. It shines out in the darkness. It exposes things that aren't true. It even exposes things in ourselves that we don't like. How many of you have woken up in the middle of the night to look at your phone and the bright screen blinds you? And you're like, I can't see, right? Has that ever happened to you? Or maybe you walk out of a dark room out into the sun and you literally can't see anything for 15 seconds until your eyes adjust. I mean, talk about being the light of the world. What's going to happen when you take your purpose into your workplace? What's it going to expose? Things you don't like about yourself and the people around you. If you take the light of God's word and you expose it on yourself, it's going to begin to reveal things that you don't necessarily appreciate. 
But when you put salt on something, when you expose the light on something and you take a step back, at first it might be bitter. At first it might be hard to see, but then wisdom steps in and you appreciate it and you recognize what it's doing in you and the people around you. And that's the point of the light. You see, light makes sight possible in the darkness. Now, we have some darkness. If you don't believe that you have darkness, you're probably living in darkness, right? People that that don't think that there's any dark nature to them or aspect to their own lives, they probably are, are blinded to their own darkness. And here's what is exposed, the darkness of our ignorance. Everybody in this church and in our community and in our world should say, I've got something to learn. The moment we think we've got it all figured out is the moment that we have deluded ourselves, And so light really does expose our intellectual darkness. Here's the other thing light exposes, our moral darkness. Light exposes how we are evil and perverted, but it demonstrates how we can be good. And so man, when you first take a bite of salt, it doesn't taste very good, but then you learn to appreciate it. When you first turn on the lights, it doesn't feel very good to your eyes, but then you learn to appreciate it. There is no greater enemy to this world than to keep Christians hidden in their closet and letting their light be closed. If you can be convinced that you are nothing but a bigot, that you're gonna be rejected by the world, that nobody wants to see what you have to offer, that you don't have any purpose, you just do your Jesus thing on Sunday morning, you keep it to yourselves, eyes down, mouth shut, the world wins. But the world will begin to appreciate when Christians start shining their light, when Christians start giving salt to the people around them, when we start exposing things as they truly are. And guess where it starts? It starts right here. So here's my encouragement to you. The only way that you can perform good works for God is if you recognize your purpose, recognize that you have a purpose, and then let God begin to expose the things in you that will give you the ability to perform the works that he planned for you to perform. And it's gonna come at a cost. Self-evaluation, introspection, looking at yourself, thinking about yourself, looking at your flaws, studying God's word and looking at where you fall short of God's glory. But that's what God wants from us. And then we're able to shine bright. Look at what also um, the Bible has to say in Ephesians chapter four. Paul instructed the church this, With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. Look, if you don't know the difference between a man and a woman, you're confused, okay? If you, I mean, think about it. Look at our culture. They are turning everything that is right wrong. If you don't know that protecting an innocent life is good, you're confused. I mean, there are some foundational moral things that we cling to that on the surface value, they're absolutely obvious. If we don't know that a corrupt government is evil and shouldn't be tolerated, we're confused. And so you know a culture is confused when they've turned everything that is normal and right and they've reversed it to be something that is opposite, right? And so so Paul is very clear. He says, look, people who are living in darkness, they are hopelessly confused. Look what else he says. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Let me show you and demonstrate to you how a culture can go wrong. The first step is to say there is no God. We have no accountability. We have no moral ultimate purpose. If we have no purpose and there is no God, then all we are left up to say is, look, we are mere animals that have been the byproduct of biological evolution for 14.5 billion years, and we establish morality on basically what we think and feel is right. And you want to see how a culture can be corrupted with some type of naturalistic Darwinian evolution model of our purpose and our origins? That's where it all starts. And so that's where their minds are. There is no God. We have no purpose. No wonder they're confused. No wonder they're doing things that are unspeakable. It's because they've started at the wrong point. God doesn't exist. And if God doesn't exist, then I have no moral responsibility. And that's what Paul is saying here. They've closed their minds and they've hardened their hearts against God. It's like Christopher Hitchens. His basically, he was a famous uh, atheist, wrote a couple books. He's passed away now. But his message was this, there is no God and I hate him. There is no God and I hate him. You can't hate somebody that doesn't exist, but that was his message that he sent. They've not only darkened their minds, but they've hardened their hearts. They have an emotional repulsion for God. You know, what's one of the words that people say, they maybe don't believe in God or maybe they do. One of the first curse words that they say when something goes wrong, it's the Lord's name in vain, right? I mean, they take God's name in vain, even though they don't believe him and they reject him, why? That's a hardened heart. 
That's a darkened mind. And so if we're going to be the light of the world, it first starts with this. He says, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure, and they've eagerly practiced every kind of impurity. And isn't that what you find when you look out to the culture? And you know what's true? That's what I found when I looked at myself. That's what we'll find when the light gets exposed to our own hearts and our own lives. That's why I became a Christian. I'm not perfect. I sin. I fall short. I'm not standing up here saying, look at everybody who's wrong. I'm saying, let the light be exposed on me and show where I've gone wrong. It starts with the church. It starts with us. Have we lost our taste? Have we lost our purpose? Are we shining light on ourselves and the people around us for the greater good? I don't like going to the dentist. But you know why I go to the dentist? because it serves a greater purpose. Who in here wants an abscessed tooth that the disease end up getting to the brain and you die? Nobody would do that. Get the tooth extracted despite how you feel so that you can have healing. And that's the same thing it is with our culture. That's what Jesus is teaching here. He goes on to say in Matthew chapter, four, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. This is, this is pretty simple, right? What's the purpose of a hill? Well, a hill, you set a light on it so that everybody can see where the city is. This was an ancient concept, a civil defense. The, you would have a place that you could retreat to. And here's the point. The city and the hill, they really have no particular significance other than to make the other visible. The hill makes the light visible. The light helps people see and makes things around them visible. And here's the point. As Christians, we will stand out in a crowd because you cannot hide the obvious. If people don't know that you're a Christian, there's something wrong with your light. Maybe you've taken a blanket and you've put it over yourself, your attitude, your actions, your behaviors, for whatever reason, but there's no such thing as a secret agent Christian. You cannot be covert in your worship and your lifestyle for God. You know, have you ever seen, um, have you ever seen the different like hand worships like, that are like kind of comedy and make fun of Christians? You know, you've got the pancakes right? You got the pancakes, you got the high five to the Lord, you know, somebody worshiping God, high fiving, but then you got the ninja praiser, all right? The ninja's down here. Hands are lifted up, but they're tucked into the pockets. Isn't that ridiculous? That's kind of funny, but here's the deal. We can't be secret Christians. We can't live a life for God and then have a separate life when we leave church on Sunday morning. A light on a hill can't be hidden. A Christian that follows Jesus can't be hidden, and so that's why he says a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And he says in verse 15, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. I think probably one of the reasons why we don't like putting ourselves out there for everyone to see is because we are afraid that people will look at our flaws and will feel like hypocrites and will feel like we're pointing the finger and judging other people. But that's, that's part of the territory of being a Christian. And I think one of the reasons why we have such a great fear of putting ourselves up on that hill and taking the blanket off our lamp and throwing ourselves out there for everyone to taste our kind of salt that we have to offer, I think we are so afraid of being judged and ostracized as a hypocritical Christian that we'd rather worship God in secret than out in public. But here's the thing. We shouldn't hide our lamps because we feel that way. It should change how we demonstrate our lamps as we go about the ministry of the gospel. Dude, I am a broken person. I am a sinner. I need God's grace. I am not perfect. I struggle with sinful thoughts and behaviors and attitudes. I struggle with, I've broken all the Ten Commandments, just to let you know, and a lot more than that. I mean, I struggle with sin every single day of my life. And if I were to present myself as some self-righteous person who's much better than you, of course I wouldn't want to stand on a hill and show myself. But the goal isn't to remove the lamp. The goal is to change how you show the lamp. And here's the deal. I'm not up here to get glory out of myself. I don't go out into the community to get glory for our church. I do these things to give glory to God. And that's where our motivation starts. And so start there. If you haven't shown your light to other people, start there. Start giving glory to God. Start telling people what God did in your own life and how he's changed and transformed you. And then you can move on from there. Our heart has to be in the right place. And so we can't take our lamps and our lights and put it under a basket. And I don't think anybody in here wants to shine a spotlight in the face of other people. And I think that's kind of where we've gone wrong. We had, look, I was, I was a knucklehead as a teenager, okay? I still kind of am now, just not as worse. One of the things that we would do as teenagers, you know, we would go to a local pizza place, 
and they had, you know, salt and pepper and Parmesan cheese. Well, one of the things that we would do is when we would use the salt, we would, you know, put some on our food and we would loosen the cap and put it back. (laughs) Isn't that messed up? That is so wrong. And so the next person to use the salt, I mean, we got in the habit of checking the tops of everything that you use just because, look, we're like, 14-year-olds, you know, after football practice, eating pizza, just being stupid. And so my, one of my friends, he grabbed the salt shaker, poor guy, he had a delicious piece of pizza sitting there, and he takes the cap, you know, he, he doesn't check the cap, and he goes to pour it, and salt just pours on top of his pizza. And immediately he's upset, and we're all laughing because we think it's funny, but it's not funny to him because we just ruined his food. I don't think God wants us to do that to the people around us, Okay. I don't think God, metaphorically, wants us to take our salt and just pour it on people for the point of tricking them or humiliating them or making their food taste awful, right? They're like, man, my life is actually worse with you in it. (laughs) I don't think that's the point of Christianity. Can you imagine if I were to take my little light and instead of making a little light, I would make it a spotlight and just shine it right into your face? I have another thing to admit to you. When I was at Christian camp, all right, this is just me, okay, fifth grade, It's something that, you know, I just thought about this week. And here I am, we all have our flashlights, you know, we're hanging out in the cabin, and I'm being a little jerk, and I'm taking my flashlight, and I'm shining it in people's faces. Well, this one really big dude that was on the bunk below me says, don't shine that light in my face. And of course, what's my instinct? It was like this, okay? Click it, shine right in his face. Well, you know what he did to me? He stood up, and he punched me. (laughs) I got exactly what I deserved, right? I think that's what happens when we try to put ourselves just in people's faces, and we're hypocrites about it, and we're obnoxious about it, and we ruin their their taste for God because we are so over the top with our religion and with our traditions. We just, we ruin things for people. That's, That's not what God wants us to do. We are a light on a hill. We're here to shine bright, to give glory to God. And if God wants to point out people's sins and flaws and behaviors, he may use us, But more importantly, may he use his word. May we point to what the word of God has to say. And may the result of our action give glory to God. Because here's the thing. We can do the right thing all we want, but sometimes we don't do the good thing. Jesus told this story. They had this tradition that, it wasn't a story, it was, you know, um, it was a parable. But they had this tradition back in the biblical times that you weren't allowed to do any work on the Sabbath day. And even if you were going across town with your donkey, that counted as work. And here was their tradition. If the man's donkey, which was his livelihood, falls into the pit, let it die, because that's the right thing to do. And Jesus comes along and he says, your traditions have nullified the word of God. You would rather let this man's donkey die because of your traditions rather than getting down in the pit and helping this man get his donkey out so that he can have a livelihood. You may be doing the right thing, but you're not doing the good thing. And I think a lot of us, when we practice our Christianity on social media, which is a a good place, but it can be inappropriate, when we practice our Christianity in our our workplaces, we can get to the point where we want to be right at the point where we're not doing good anymore. And so we have to have this balance. The light of the world is supposed to be a good thing, a beacon of hope, a place where people can come to, not a place where people feel like their lives are worse than when you were in it. And so we should be the light of the world. We shouldn't shine lights in people's faces when they don't want it. We shouldn't use salt on people's pizzas and trick them into falling into our traps and our self-righteousness. And so look at what Jesus says in verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's the point. And so everything that we do should be a spotlight pointing up to God. A spotlight pointing up to God. It's not a megaphone declaring ourselves, right? That's the difference. Paul told Timothy this. He said, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not obvious cannot remain hidden forever. And so maybe you've been holding this Jesus thing in to your family and your coworkers and your friends, or maybe even the person sitting next to you. My encouragement to you is this. Don't hide it. Don't put it under a blanket or a basket Don't hide the person that God knows you can be. Start living it today. You know, we're not talking about self-glory. We're not talking about hypocrisy. We're talking about giving God the glory through our life. And that can happen in two ways. Good things you do, bad things you don't do. 
I read this uh, quote the other day, 90% of success in life is not messing up and doing stupid stuff. <laughs> Isn't that true for those of you who are experienced in life? Think about all the areas where your life has went wrong, and it's probably because we were stupid and we did something that was wrong. And so 90% of success in life is not doing things that really mess up our life. Peter put it like this. He says, dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Many of you know about my neighbor's situation that I had um, about three years ago. Uh, this guy was a nightmare. He, he terrorized my wife and I. And um, he worked for, for the government. And so we ended up selling our house and we moved to a different home. And it was just, it was awful, right? Um, so here I am three years later and I get a phone call from a background investigator. And uh, this was just, you know, here pretty recent. And so this guy calls me up. And he wants to, you know, I live next to this guy, so he'd obviously moved on to a different job, and now he wants to interview me. And I said, well, are you going to tell this guy anything that I have to say? No, we promise. This is just for our background investigation. Nobody knows anything about it, and that's great. Well, when he came and talked with me, he said, man, this, this guy really had nothing good to say about you. In fact, he pretty much blames you for everything that's gone wrong in his life. And he says, but when I started looking you up online and I looked at some of your social media posts and saw what you did and what you had to say, he goes, what this guy was saying didn't match up at all with what I saw. And I'm just telling you this, not to boast or brag on myself, but I was like, oh, that's why Peter wrote that. That's why Peter wrote that, right? I finally experienced it myself. Not that I haven't experienced it before, but here was somebody trying to impeach my character, but yet the demonstration of my life proved this guy's lies wrong. And I didn't have to even say a word. If we're going to shine bright, half of it is not doing things that darken our lamps. And so we should be living in such a way that when people accuse us of, uh, us of wrongdoing, it's unbelievable. It doesn't establish the basis of our character. But it's not just about not doing bad things. If we're going to be citizens of the light, kingdom workers, the kind of person God wants us to be, we've got to go out and do good works. I mean, after all, that's what this entire sermon is all about. And so there are two things that Jesus is telling us if we're going to be the light of the world. Number one, we must be visible. You've got to be seen. Jesus has to be known. I'm not telling you to go out and buy a Jesus bumper sticker and put it on your car or anything like that, right? But through the demonstration of your character, God wants you to be seen. Don't hide it. And when you do show it, don't show it hypocritically. Show it with grace and forgiveness and hope. Show it like the light of the world that exposes the darkness. Second of all, we must radiate. I like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6. He says, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so that we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. That in other words, this, because of my relationship with God, God's light can't help but shine through me. And so I must not only be visible, but I must radiate the kind of light that Jesus had to offer. And when you look at Jesus and the light that he had to offer, it was a hope to the hopeless. It was forgiveness for sinners. It was welcoming of people who were broken, and it was disdain for hypocritical Pharisees who thought they did nothing wrong. Jesus was only really harsh with one group of people, and they were the religious leaders of the day who lied about their lifestyle, who reflected holiness, and in the meantime practiced darkness, and they weren't living authentic lives. That's the kind of light that God wants us to have. May we be people of grace, but authentic, May we show forgiveness and demonstrate kindness, but not be something that we aren't. May we reflect the light of Jesus Christ. And so what good work should we perform? Well, it's pretty simple. First of all, have faith. It's where it all starts. Like I said earlier on in the message, Gentiles, their minds are darkened. They don't have a clue. They're confused because they reject God and their heart is hardened towards him. Have faith. We read this last week. People went up to Jesus in John 6. They said, Jesus, what may we do that, me, that we may work the works of God? And you know what Jesus' response was? Believe in me. And so the greatest work that you could ever perform starting this morning is accepting Christ, placing your faith in him. The other thing that you could do is have a faith that works. 
We all can say that we believe. James, we're not going to go into this because we're already a little bit over, but James 2 made this very clear. We need to have a faith that works. And if we believe in Jesus, but we don't do anything about it, we have a dead faith. In other words, we don't have faith at all. And so we should feed the hungry. We should clothe the naked. We should bear with each other in the burdens of life. Man, I can't tell you how important it is to have brothers and sisters in the Lord to do life with. My family is all but, but dead and gone. My mom lives in Florida, really don't have a close relationship with her. Uh, we only have a few members on Angel's side of the family. And it has been the church that has kept us together and strong and vibrant. It's been the church that's been our family. It's been the church that's picked up our burdens when we needed it. And the church can be that for you. And you can be that for each other. That's a good work. Encourage one another. You will not believe the power that your words have. Giving somebody a phone call, appreciating somebody. Parents, when you go pick up your kids, thank the teachers that are there. When you see the, the, the schedulers for, your, for your, your kids, appreciate them. Say, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for what you do for my family so that I can come and learn and worship. When you see people who have sung on this stage and preached the gospel, appreciate them, encourage them. When you see people that you know are having a hard time, send them a note in the mail. Do something, a good work, to encourage people. The Bible also says to teach others with integrity and dignity. Teach people the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Explain the hope that you have. And then finally, be charitable with your money. You will never feel the radical transformation of the gospel until you give away that which you love the most. Could be your money. Could be your time. Could be your family. You know, sometimes we feel bad about this, but often we do things here at church that Angel and the kids aren't able to participate in. But do you know how much my wife serves by being behind the scenes and taking care of our kids so that I can be free to go do stuff for the kingdom? Wives, you're awesome. When you let your husbands go to serve, to do, it's one of the greatest things that you could ever do for the Lord. And it is a sacrifice. Man, Angel and I, I'm telling you right now, our kids are wearing us out. <laughs> I cannot keep my son off the kitchen table. He wipes his boogers on everything that I have access to. My daughter absolutely humiliated me in the store the other day. She wanted this pack of dolls, and I didn't let her have it, and she threw a fit, and she didn't stop. I broke out, parents. I broke out one of those cold sweats. You're like, do I stay? Do I leave? What do I do here? You know what I mean? And so parents who spend all of this time with their kids, you love them, but let's face it, we all have a breaking point, point. and then the husband is gone the entire day, and what do you get to do? You get to be at home with your kids, taking care of them, changing their diapers, feeding them, having them yell and cry at you, and just, it never ends. Now, I would not change that for the world. I love my kids, absolutely. But look, we're human. We all need breaks. And man, my wife is there whenever I need her to be. And maybe you can be that for your spouse or for your family to give them the ability to go serve by taking care of the ones you love the most. And so we're gonna end with this. Have a faith have a faith that works, and there's only two ways that you can do that. Get ready spiritually and get ready doctrinally. You cannot practice that which you don't know. Next month, we're going to begin a series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Can you name them? You don't have to do it right now, but just think about it. If you're like, oh, wait, I can't, I can't name them. How can you practice that which you don't know? Even more so, how can you practice something when all you can see is your own deficiency and self-sin? Let me end with these two scriptures. 2 Timothy 2.21, so if anyone cleanses himself of what is unfit, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, and prepared for every good work. 